Hello there everyone, welcome back to the channel, to the video. Um, I do realize that I have not really posted a video a week and I do apologize, but I kind of wanted to take a small break for myself this week, so I'm pretty sure that that was more than deserved for the work that I've done so far on this channel. So, I want to start getting back into the swing of things here, and basically, today is going to be another one of those surprise topics. And it's also going to lead into what we're going to discuss later this coming week here. So today's topic, well, in this video at least, will be on the Indian removal during the 1830s here in the United States. This coincides with the infamous Trail of Tears, which basically was the forced removal of the Cherokee people in particular. But Indian removal refers to the removal of the southeastern Indian tribes in the southeastern portion of the United States to from their homelands east of the Mississippi River to new land that was be to be relocated to new land west of the Mississippi in Indian Territory, which is now the state of Oklahoma, during the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Now this is a very kind of sad portion. And I honestly I think it's a very bad portion of American history that we ever did this. It's very unfortunate. So I felt this was something that needed to be addressed. At the end of this video, I will discuss our plans here for the coming week, and we will go from there. Again, we go off the wonderful book of knowledge, the notebook, to help us do this video accurately. That way I have the ideas jotted down and information gathered. So, without further ado, we need to start with the topic here, and we're going to start with the prelude, as always, to understanding the situation. Now, Indians, as we probably all know, or Native Americans, and that's what I'm going to try to call them here. I do apologize if I say Indians, if there's any actual Native Americans watching this. I do apologize. I, I know it's a popular term, but in actual term, it's kind of derogatory and not true. They're not Indians at all that they are native americans we mis we get the misconception of the calling them indians because when christopher columbus came over here in 1492 he unfortunately thought that he was in india and thus deemed the natives as indians because he actually thought he was in india not realizing no you were not in india well the name stuck anyway in technical terms they are called native americans so basically what happens is after the American Revolution, this is where we're really going to start, we could go way back to from 1492 to present on the Indian treatment, but that would take a long while and get through a ton of work. So we're going to start off with the United States at least. And the United States did not, although we declared independence in 1776, the war, the American Revolution did not actually end and Britain did not recognize the American independence until 1783 with the Treaty of Paris that was signed then that ended the American Revolution and officially recognized the United States as a newly independent nation. Following the American Revolution, the United States government fought several skirmishes slash wars with several tribes east of the Mississippi. At this time, there were still Indians east of the Mississippi. Mostly, these wars were fought on the frontiers. And at this time, the frontiers were states like Kentucky, Tennessee, the southeastern areas of what would become Mississippi, Alabama, the Northwest Territory, of which Ohio, where I currently live, was a major battleground. In fact, this was probably the most contentious because of the Ohio River and its valley that it had it was a high, highly valuable zone. And of course, as white settlers flooded the region, they pushed the Indians gradually further and further west, and eventually the Indians started to rise up and try to resist. In Native Americans, I gotta get this right here. I do apologize. I know I'm used to calling on that, but I do apologize. Again, my continued apologies if I say Indians, and I don't realize it. My continued apologies. Basically, during the 1790s, in Ohio at least, a bunch of the Native American tribes, mainly led by tribes such as the Miami, the Delaware, the Shawnee, and even in down south you had the Creek, they instigated massive wars of resistance. Now we're going to focus here on the Ohio ones for the, 19, for the 1790s. 
And during this time, an uprising was happening in Ohio against settlers that were coming into the region. Ohio was not a state yet. And eventually, these led to open battles with the U.S. Army under Arthur St. Clair, and who eventually lost his chance, and then under General Anthony Wayne, who crushed the Indian resist Native American resistance <laughs> at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794. Near, which is near, I think, let me think here, it's on the, it was on the Maumee River, it's near Toledo. Well, anyway, after this, the Treaty of Greenville was signed in Ohio, and this basically either removed most of the Native American tribes from Ohio, or it put any that remained on reservations of land. So this kind of ended the fighting in Ohio as it ceded most of the land of what would become Ohio and some of what would become the states of Michigan and Indiana to American white settlement control. Now this process continued not just during the 1790s, but it would continue up till the War of 1812 and after the war. Now during the War of 1812, many Indian tribes, of course, were lured into the well, Native American tribes were lured into the prospect of uniting against white settlement and forcing them to leave their lands under the Shawnee chief Tecumseh. Now Tecumseh, unfortunately, he sided with the British. He eventually was killed during the War of 1812 at the Battle of the Thames in 1813, and this basically crushed any chance of a Native American united resistance, because with Tecumseh gone, they had no re really effective leader, and the resistance coalition just kind of crumbled. Now, after the war, the United States continued to push Native Americans further and further west, or it continued to push them on, settle, on re reservations of land. Now, in the southeast, this was a different story, unlike in Ohio and Indiana and the rest of the Northwest Territory. In the southeast, such as the territory around Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Tennessee, and although Florida became a territory of the U.S. in 1819 after it was purchased from Spain, these were the southeast states. And be, keep in mind that we had also bought, in 1803, we had bought the Louisiana Purchase from France, which expanded the United States territory, doubling its size, which included a huge chunk of territory, which was west of the Mississippi River. And in 1812, the first state to be carved out of this territory was, of course, the state of Louisiana. The rest of it was mostly unorganized. Now, during the 1790s and during the early years of the United States' um, uh, existence, many people didn't know what to do with the Native populations. They didn't know what exactly we could do with them. And many proponents came around and ideas, and one of them that was most firmly had the most popular support, it even gained the support of George Washington when he was president, was what they called integration, or assimilation, I think, I, one of the two. They voted to maybe inter integrate the Native Americans into European white society. And basically by doing this, they would, that was basically converting them to Christianity, teaching them economic practices that were European in style, and in some cases, like especially in the South, some Native, Southern Native American tribes even adopted the practice of slavery of African Americans, just like white plantation owners did, and they would also learn to speak and read English and form European-style governments for their tribes. Now, many Native American tribes were not too thrilled with this idea. They saw it as an attack on their traditions and their beliefs, but, however, in the Southeast, they were, the five main tribes in the Southeast did kind of try to adopt and integrate into this system, into the white society, and these tribes would become known as the five civilized tribes because they were trying to be like the white man. They tried to get along with them by adopting their ways. And these five tribes were known as the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, and the Cherokee. And just fun, fun fact here for, well, a couple fun facts here. The Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw lived mostly in Tennessee, Mississippi, and Alabama. The Cherokee lived in Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. And the Seminole, of course, lived in Florida. And also for a fun fact here, out of the, I, not Indians, Native Americans, 
Native I have never really I've only ever seen one Native American tribe like met people from a Native American tribe and that is the Cherokee. So this is the only tr Native American tribe I've actually seen Native Americans myself from. Of course, it's modern day. So they're a lot different than back then, but it's the only legitimate Native American member members that I've ever seen is from they were members of the Cherokee tribe. Now what happens here, although these five tribes tried to assimilate and they tried to integrate into white society, many white settlers in the South weren't exactly thrilled about this because there was something that they wanted. And it wasn't the Indians' lives. It wasn't their livestock. It wasn't all that. They wanted their land because we always want Indian land, no Native American land, either way. But we always want that. Why? Because we're greedy white people and we know no better. And I hate to tell this, but to us white people, including myself, that greed has now transitioned to from land, it has now transitioned into money and power. Yes, it, it, the greed is still there, it's just changed into what it wants. Many American frontier settlers in particular, they actually feared the Native Americans. They didn't trust them. And they saw them as an unfamiliar alien people, and sometimes they depicted them as savages. White settlers and farmers often, especially in the southeast, they often wanted the Indian lands, well, Native American lands, Native American lands. I'm going to get this right. I'm going to get this right. <laughs> they often wanted the Native Americans' land so that they could grow crops on it. In particular, the one big crop that was a big hit in the South at that time, and it's the same one that was driving slavery sky high, was cotton. The same stuff in your clothing, kids. So that kind of drives an ambition to get this Indian Native American land, Native American land, because this Native American land is perfect for farming, and it's also, it's got gold, it's got valuable minerals that the Native Americans aren't mining themselves because they see really no need other than maybe a few jewelry. They don't have a bi the big main needs that European society does for them, and thus there's still a lot of precious metals like gold, silver, and some other metals like iron that could be mined and used. Now, the five civilized tribes in particular, they occupy over 125 million acres of land in the states of Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi. This land is sought after. It is basically envied. The white settlers want it, but they can't have it because it's Native American land. Well, many Southerners start to want this so badly that they start doing some unfortunate acts that they should not be. And many Southerners began to antagonize the Indian Native American tribes living on these lands. They start by stealing livestock, for example. They burn and loot their homes. They mass murder entire villages or little settlements. And they even simply just sit on the land and refuse to leave. Now, at first, this was just average, everyday people that were being greedy and wanted the Native American land. Well, eventually, the state governments in the Southeast or South, they start joining in this process. And the state governments, they begin to aid in these efforts. They basically start limiting Native American rights, and they even adopt laws that threatens their sovereignty as independent sovereign nations, which is what the United States Congress considered them to be. Well, this kind of goes on and on and on. And this treatment continues. And this was not only because it was widely popular in the South, but because they have a very popular and very powerful ally, and that was the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was our seventh president. He was president from 1829 to 1837. And he's kind of one of your iffy presidents. If you don't know his face, just pull out a 20 out of your wallet and you got the face. The guy on the $20 bill is Andrew Jackson, just in case we did not know that. And in case you still don't know that, this is Jackson. This is Andrew Jackson. Ironically, he's also the man that gave the Democratic Party its name and its symbol. 
I don't, I'm not really talking politics here. Lord knows we might talk about politics. The people are going to go nuts and ugh, that's a mess. But Jackson was a very, he's a maverick and he was very much a rough, he's a rough guy. He, he was not a guy you want to get on the bad side of. And his uh, critical uh, political opponents during his campaign for president, they called him a Jack Blank. I'm not going to say the word here on YouTube because I do not personally want to say it out loud at all. But I, another word for it would be a donkey. Well, Jackson did not take this as an insult. He did not. Jackson actually adopted the donkey as his party's symbol. And this is actually where the Democratic Party has the donkey as their symbol. They get it from Jackson. Jackson was the first president to be an openly with the Democratic Party. Beforehand, there had been the Democratic-Republican Party, but this party had split, and the section of it that was pro-Jackson renamed themselves as the Democrats. And to this day, they are the oldest and most liberal of the political parties in the United States. The Republicans took a different shoot, and the other half of the Democratic-Republicans that did not quite believe of Jackson, they kind of devolved. But some of them merged with a previous political party, with members of exiled member, well, previous members of another extinct political party, the Federalist Party, and they formed the Whigs during the 1840s and 1850s. And eventually, the Whigs during the 1850s become divided over the slavery issue, and the anti-slavery figure Whigs they form their own party in the form of the Republican Party, in which Abraham Lincoln becomes the first Republican president in 1860. So that's kind of a little political party history right there, but we're not getting into the topics here. We're not getting into political stuff. I know that's a messy topic, and I don't like to discuss it here or anywhere. But, ugh. Anyway, Jackson was a Southerner, and he was a slave owner, and he was a former United States Army general. He had actually fought in the War of 1812, had commanded the American forces at the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, and had actually stopped the British from taking the city. So he was a very well-known general. Jackson had pursued after the war, he continued in his army career, but he enforced a couple of brutal campaigns against the, let me see here what tribes it was. It was against the Creek and the Seminole tribes. And in the process, both of these tribes were forced to cede land to white settlers due to the brutality of Jackson's campaigns against them. Jackson was very much for Indian removal, as he termed it. Yes, in this instance, I'm going to call it Indian removal, because that's what they called it. But in my personal view, that's not what I'm going to call it. And also, just for a f f kind of front-runner here, Jackson, he, he did some good things, but he had some bad. So, And by the way, well, there's been a debate over whether or not to remove Andrew Jackson from the $20 bill. Part of the reason there's been that debate is not just because of his widespread support for slavery in the past, but because also of his treatment toward Native Americans in the United States. Now, to this day, I don't know what the exact situation is or on that debate, but that is part of the reason why the debate is even happening. Is because people question, why are we honoring a man on our currency that did a couple of really bad things? <laughs> Now, Jackson continued his program of Indian removal when he got into the office of the president in 1829. And the, a year after he became president, his first major legislation act that he enforced was the what was passed and called the Indian Removal Act of 1830. In this act, it allowed the federal government to the power to exchange native-held land east of the Mississippi River for land to, to give them land in exchange that was west of the Mississippi in what is now Oklahoma, which at the time, it this area of land that they were going to get to the Native Americans was known as Indian Territory. Now, the government was supposed to negotiate the treaties that in which the tribes would slowly and pe hopefully peacefully do this, through a peaceful manner. Jackson disregarded this rule entirely. Jackson instead 
uses the army on multiple occasions to enforce this and force the Native Americans out of their homelands. The Choctaw, they become the first tribe to have to undergo this forced removal, and this happens in the winter of 1831 from their homelands in Alabama. It was actually the Choctaw who first came up with a term of Trail of Tears, but it became very famous when the Cherokee were later removed. So the Choctaw are gone by winter of 1831. They've been removed. Most of these Indian, not Indians, Native Americans that were being removed were mar marching on foot. They were not marching on horses. They were marching on foot for thousands of miles during freezing cold weather at times. And in the process, many of them got sick. Many of them got froze to death. And a lot of them ended up, thousands of them ended up dying along the way. In 1836, the Creeks, they are removed from their homelands in Louisiana and Mississippi. And the Chickasaw are then follow in 1837 when the U.S. Army removes them. And here's a really fun fact. Jackson was a very, propon very big proponent of Indian removal. But ironically, during the War of 1812, Jackson had actually had Creek allies in particular. The Creek had been his allies at the Battle of New Orleans. He had had them as his allies, and now he's back trading his, what used to be his own battlefield comrades. So it's kind of a fun fact here. He was an Indian fighter, but during the War of 1812, he was more than happily friends with them. So it's kind of sad. Now, two nations in particular out of the five, the two that are left, the Cherokee and the Seminole, they're the ones that give up the most resistance. And ironically, they're opposites of each other. The Cherokee tried to do this through the own, they were the only tribe that they didn't resort to violence, which they weren't the only tribe to not resort to violence, but they were the only tribe to try to appeal and stop this by going through the court system. The Cherokee Nation, they tried to go through the courts to try to get the okay from the U.S. government that, oh, yeah, we're wrong, you cannot, the president cannot move you. And in fact, they actually won a Supreme Court case. If I look back here in my notes, we have, in 1832, the Supreme Court case of Worcester versus Georgia, uh, Supreme, Just, Su Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall, he basically declared that the acts that were being taken against the Cherokees, against by both the state of Georgia, which was where most of their homelands were, and against President Jackson and his administration, were unconstitutional since Native nations were considered sovereign states in which state laws have absolute no authority, nor do federal laws. Basically saying, they're a sovereign nation. You have no authority to be telling them what to do. You cannot remove them. They're free to stay. Well, Jackson and the Southern people were so adamant about this, and they really just didn't care. And in fact, President Jackson was quoted as saying this little statement here, and this is in his own words, he hit about Chief Justice John Marshall. When he made this ruling, Jackson later said this about Marshall's decision, and this is his own words. He has made his ruling. Now let him enforce it. Jackson was basically saying that Marshall may have made his ruling and dictated that he did not agree with that the Indians should be removed, well, Native Americans, but Jackson said he, he may have said so, but he really doesn't have no authority to do so because I am the authority that will get to do it. He has none. He can't enforce his own rule. He can't even enforce his own word. So guess what? It's going to happen anyway. So that also kind of sets up a real kind of odd case where I don't wa understand why Jackson wasn't exactly impeached or brought charges against for a crime because he was basically disregarding the balance of power between the three branches of government. He was ignoring the judicial system entirely. And the president is supposed to work in coalition with the legislative and the judicial branches. And in this case, he thought he was higher than the judicial system, and they actually let him get away with it. Now, Jackson didn't care that the Cherokees had won this court case. And he was still trying to negotiate a treaty. And in 1835, three years after this court case had been done, a few self-appointed Cherokee representatives signed a treaty with the United States government in what was called the Treaty of New Ikota, which was named after the Cherokee Nation capital in Georgia, which was New Ikota, or New Akata, I don't know how they pronounce it. 
And this tr basically traded all Cherokee lands east of the Mississippi for $5 million and, relocate and provided relocation assistance and payment for the lost property. Unfortunately, these self-proclaimed representatives were not declared to be representatives by either the Cherokee Nation people or by even their chief, whose name was John Ross. And just so we know here, let me look. Uh, no, that's not it. Right here. This is a picture of Cherokee Chief John Ross. I remind you that the Cherokee were one of the five civilized tribes, and they were kind of adopted some European way, so that explains why he looks less than, like your typical Native American that you would expect from a photograph, and he looks more like a European white man. Because he's very had adopted some of their ways. So basically, all the, and because of this, John Ross and over 16,000 of the Cherokee people, they pro protested Congress to do not approve this treaty. It does not represent our entire nation, and they signed a petition. Congress approved the treaty anyway because they, they had what they wanted. They had something saying, we can take your land. They didn't care if it was representative or not. It said, we can take your land. And by 1838, though, even though the Congress had approved the treaty, only 2,000 of the Cherokee had left their Georgia homeland in Tennessee and, and also in Tennessee and North Carolina. And because of this, President Martin Van Buren, who had become president after Andrew Jackson, he had been Jackson's vice president, and after Jackson had served two terms, he stepped down and got behind Van Buren to be his successor. Van Buren did win a term. He only served one term, though. And Martin Van Buren very much continued the policies of his mentor and, pre and predecessor, and he basically ordered General Winfield Scott to take 7,000 of U.S. troops to force the process to remove them. And this basically hindered that effort. Scott and his troops, they basically break into Cherokee Nation territory, they force all of them into stockades at Bayonet Point, and then they allow the whites to loot the Cherokee homes and their property. After this is done, Scott and his 7,000 U.S. soldiers then forcibly march and escort the remaining Cherokee to their land, ra land reservation in Indian Territory across the Mississippi. They would trek over 1,200 miles to do this, and this eventually over roughly between 4,000 and 5,000 Cherokee died during this journey, due to illnesses such as typhus, dysentery, cholera, starvation, and even the co cold weather. And this is what has mainly been remembered as the main big trail of tears. This is what the Cherokee termed it as, and it very much fits it because they're crying. These have been their homes for generations, and they're being forced off it just because of greedy white people. Yeah, let's go greedy white people. Let's go. I hate to say this, but sometimes I hate my own authenticity. I really do, because we are guilty of a lot of crap. We are guilty of racism, we are guilty of crimes against others, and we try to deny it at times, and I hate to say it, it ain't right. It is not right. I, I Sometimes I hate my own authenticity. I, I, hate to, I shouldn't have to say that, but I do. Because I do recognize we've done some, my, my ethnicity, not myself personally, but my ethnicity has done a lot of crimes in history that has not been right. We think we're a dominant race compared to others. And I hate to tell us, I hate to tell fellow white people this, we are not. And in some ways, different ethnicities, they're actually superior to us because they have the courage and the courtesy to simply stand up and not be that way. Do what's right. And we can't seem to be like that. So my apologies to anyone that may be a victim of racism from a white person. I do apologize. I myself do see shame in it. And I do apologize for any inconvenience it may have cost you. <laughs> but anyway, that's a racism issue. And I don't want to really get too focused on that. Because I know that's also another sensitive topic. So that takes care of the Cherokee. There's only one tribe left now that hasn't left the South. And that is the Seminoles in Florida. Unfortunately, this is going to be the tribe that the United States cannot push out. The Seminole, they resisted too, but they did not go to the court. They went to war. And the Seminole fought the U.S. Army three times. Three separate wars. 
and the U.S. Army, no matter what they did, could not force them out of Florida. They only managed to force maybe a couple thousand out of the tribe. That was it. The rest of them were stuck in Florida. They would not leave. They were stubborn. But I don't blame them. I, I stand on the side of the I stand on the side of the Native Americans in this issue. Uh, they were treated very wrongly by the U.S. government, and they have been continually. Many of the Seminole that after these wars they fled into hiding in the Everglades, and this is where they actually lived for decades after. And they even until basically to, up to the current day, there is two Seminole tribes. There's a Seminole tribe in. There's a recognized federal tribe, Seminole recognized tribe in Oklahoma, the, the descendants of those that actually did move. And then there is a recognized Seminole tribe of Florida, which is the descendants of those that fought back and did not move and went to exile in the Everglades. They still live in their homeland. Now, many of these Seminole, as the decades went by, they definitely hid off from the federal authorities, and the Everglades was a perfect place, because back then it was not a big tourist site. People were actually afraid to go in the Everglades because it was so swampy, it was wilderness, it was alligators, it was stuff. They didn't have the big tourism like they do now. And back then it was very much possible to go live in the Everglades, because there was no national park, there was no nothing. It was wilderness, and the Seminole fit in perfectly. They knew how to use the land, and it, they were so successful at this that they even would allow runaway African-American slaves because remember, slavery still exists at this time in the South, they would give them refuge and allow them to join the tribe and protect them. If they ran away and joined the Seminole tribe, they would welcome them with open arms. So in that part, they were, yes, they were very helpful in that part, and I, I, I thank them for that because slavery was ugh, it's America's greatest sin that it's ever done. It really is. One, now, one day here, we will have a separate video on the history of slavery in the United States. It is probably one of the most ugly, one of the most disgusting, one of the most putrid and evil chapters in this nation's history, and it should never have been done in the first place. And I apologize to any that have ancestors that were slaves. I apologize to any of you that may have had that because it, it, it was messed up. It should never have been done, ever. It is wrong. Well, this basically concludes the Indian removal, but in the southeast at least. Now, although this was mainly to affect the southeast, separate acts were passed to remove remaining Indian, well, Native Americans that were already on reservations up north, and like Ohio even had a couple reservations left, like of the Wyandotte and the Seneca tribe, and they were forced to move from the reservations into new ones in Oklahoma. Well, Indian Territory. In fact, the last Indian tribe to leave Ohio, I believe, was I believe was the Wyandotte, and I think that was around 1840, 1844. And today, there's no Indian tribes, well, Native American tribes, up in this portion of the United States. You had tribes that were finally moved out of it entirely, such as the Delaware, the Wyandotte, the Miami, the Shawnee, the Kickapoo. They were all removed, and it was kind of an unfortunate thing. Now, by the 1840s, most of the Native Americans that were east of the Mississippi had been finally, successfully, at least in the government's eyes, removed, with the exception of the Seminole. And basically, the government then again lied and said that, oh, well, you're going to have this Indian territory, you can live there forever, and we'll never disturb you again. Big, fat, lying government officials. Just like politicians today. In fact, here's the one thing I'd like to point out with Indian Territory, what the big flaw was. The big belief was that the land out west was empty, it was free, that we could move the Native Americans out there and they could have all this new land and they'd have no problem. Well, there's one big problem that the U.S. official government officials did not take into account back then, and that was the factor that land was already occupied by other Native American tribes. So when you send all these tribes from the east to the west, well, yeah, you're relocating them, relocating them to land, but you're relocating them onto somebody else's land, and then they come into conflict with them. 
they didn't understand that prospect. Just because it seemed empty to civilized man didn't mean it was empty to man entirely and that someone didn't claim ownership of it. So that was the big problem there. Now, as I mentioned, the United States, of course, did not end up keeping this promise. And if they increasingly, as white westward settlement expanded during the, starting in about the 1840s and 1850s, especially after the Civil War, the area that was known as Indian Territory was gradually sh shrunk and shrunk and got smaller and smaller and was reduced by the government. And it especially, it was reduced, especially for the, the territory that was given to the five civilized tribes after the American Civil War due to the factor that during the Civil War, a large number of the in Native American tribes in Indian Territory actually sided with the Confederates, and this was probably mostly because of the broken promises of the United States government. So honestly, I don't blame them for siding with the Confederates on that part because of the factor in most of their eyes, the United States government's cheated us and lied to us. Why would we want to side with you? Maybe the, the Confederates might just be better. And, of course, there was the darker part of it as well. So for some tribes, such as the Cherokee, did own African-American slaves and saw more sympathy with the southern nation. So, of course, after the war, these tribes were viewed as co-conspirators in the War of Rebellion, as it was called then. And, of course, these tribes' punishment included a more severe laws and the reduction of their current reservations that they had. And this expansion continued and continued until roughly, until finally, in 1907, just over 100 years ago, Indian Territory finally disappeared forever when it was merged and combined with the Oklahoma Territory to form the new state of Oklahoma in 1907. So that is basically the gist here of Indian removal. And here, I'll give you a map here before we start going to other things. This is the map of the Indian removal, or well, Native American removal, or Indian removal as it was termed. The Cherokee lived about right in here. This was their land. You had the Cherokee, you had the Creek, who were in actually who were here in Alabama. You had the Choctaw and Chickasaw, and then you had the Seminole down here. And right down here is the Everglades. And keep in mind, when the Seminole were trying to be removed. Florida was just a territory. Florida was not actually admitted as a state until 1845. By that time, though, all these were. But anyway, you can see there's a lot of fighting that took place down here. But you can also see the trails that were taken by some all along the way to get to their Indian territory, which is over here where Oklahoma is now, this area right here. I understand I just had that down for a second. Here, I'll put this up to the screen a little better. This right here is Indian Territory that was set aside. This is now mostly in the modern state of Oklahoma. In fact, it's part of the reason that today, there's Oklahoma actually has a large Native American population because most of these tribes are still there. A lot of the United States' Native American tribes that were formerly east of the Mississippi now reside in Oklahoma due to this. But that is... Indian removal, and that's the paths that were taken. Yeah, you can see, they had to go a long way. And the Mississippi River is about right... right here. So anything this way, go over here. Get out. Yeah, bad, bad history. So that concludes that. Um... Yeah, definitely not one of the brightest chapters in our nation's history. De definitely not. It, it was a crime that we ever did that to the Native Americans, and I feel regret that it ever happened to them, even though I wasn't personally part. So that covers that. So as for this coming week, I, I kind of debated over what I wanted to do here for some videos, and I kind of came up with a topic. I want to continue with a certain this certain political decade in the United States, the 1830s, because it was the era of Jacksonian democracy, which was a specific term given to the administration of Andrew Jackson due to how it changed the American political field and some certain events that happened during his tenure as president. So for this coming week, I will hit a video that talks 
simply about the principles and life during the time of Jacksonian democracy, as it really changed the political thinking and ideology of a lot of Americans and how the country was kind of run. And it gave a rebirth of democracy to the country. I want to talk about that and, because it's not something most people really know about. We've had revivals of democracy in this country, and this was truly probably the first major revival we had of that demo democracy in this country. Mostly due to the fact that Jackson, to my knowledge, he was the first president to be elected that wasn't a wealthy guy. He had been raised as a normal, everyday citizen. He had rose his way from basically nothing to the top, like you can now. Like, you can be a normal citizen and grow up to be president. You just got to put your mind to it. I'm not going to express any of my future plans personally, but uh, there's probably your hint. But anyway, I want to definitely hit that because that's an important chapter in American history here. And also, for an event that happened in here that was other than the Indian removal was the important thing of the nullification crisis that occurred with South Carolina during this in which South Carolina tried to nullify and disobey a federal tariff and tried to declare that the state had the power to uh, basically nullify or cancel any laws made by the federal government. And in fact, South Carolina threatened to secede from the Union. No, this is not the Civil War secession. This is prior. This is like 30 years before. Ironically, by the same state that would be the first one to take the secession line eventually and it caused a crisis in the united states so the, but the problem was that unlike the future presidents that would do nothing when the secession crisis came jackson threatened to invade south carolina if it seceded he would send hundreds of thousands of troops and hang anybody that supported it he would he, basically he was basically proving the nation is not going to fall apart under my watch it will not so I want to hit that not only because it was a crisis during this time, but because it is kind of a precursor to what is going to come about 30 years down the road when South Carolina would become the first state to secede from the Union. Of course, not over the nullification, but over the issue of slavery, basically. But it also plays, it's the first example of a southern state displaying that little idea that they had clung to until the until the Civil War was done, and that was the idea of states' rights. And that is a very touchy issue, with especially from if you're from the South, I understand. So if you've got a touchy thing on that, I recommend you may not want to watch that video at all, because I understand that there may be some things I will say, out of my opinion, that may not judge right with yours. But if you wouldn't mind listening to it, feel free to. I will try not to insult anyone. <laughs> But I will state what the Constitution at least states is true. But I want to discuss that because not only was it a crisis, but it's the first real case that you had of a state trying to assert it had more power than the federal government and was the first real indicator of what was to come 30, down, 30 years down the road. So we will talk this week about Jacksonian democracy and the nullification, then the South Carolina nullification crisis, and then we will move on from there of whatever happens. Again, I am free to having any suggestions for history topic videos. Simply put something in the discussion page on the channel or put something below in the comments on this video or any, or any other video. I would feel more than happy. I would feel more than happy to do so. Anytime that you mention it, I will even fit a third video in for the week if that happened. So be free, feel free to add that anytime you wish. So that basically wraps it up for this video. Hopefully this week, coming week goes well. Basically, I hope that it does go well. So that ends it for here. Uh, like, subscribe to the channel. Like the video if you enjoyed it at all. And I hope to see you all coming back here next week. Well, not next week, but this coming week for the videos that we're going to have this week about good old democracy and nullification. <laughs> so ha have a good night, and we'll see you here later this week.